Yes, sir. Yeah. Going back to, uh, I would like everyone to be very attentive because this is really the heart of this uh, three-day session, uh, this notion of time, because I'm going to concentrate on just this notion of time for the rest, uh, rest of the time we have together. So I, I would like your participation very much. Very uh, good. Yes, 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 please, please, just, just <laughs> please listen. Every one of you is going to have ample time to talk because this, unless we get this right, I would feel that uh, we haven't accomplished much in our gathering here today, or because for these three days. Questions is very tricky. Sure. It cannot cannot be answered by from, from single perspective. Yes, it's that's that's what I'm questions. trying to right. No, no, that is that is true, and this is this is really. Yeah, please be, be very frank and very open until until we get to a common understanding of what is being said. So what. Uh, back I to the, and there are, I, I, I will admit, there are dimensions of the question, but the core of what I want to, to convey, if we could all get to that point, inshallah, then, then uh, uh, there is, we want to stop? Yeah. Uh, no, please give us five or three more minutes, okay? Then we take a break. But uh, 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 let me just recap before we break. Uh, but just a minute, I will give you time. Uh, I, w I just want to keep the, the kernels of uh, our discussion together. So once in a while, I'll just put things together and we'll just spread them again and put them together again. So what Sister Rebecca added to, to the notion was the structure of the traditional society which had emerged before the Renaissance period into certain uh, sort of ossified structures, the, the classes, and uh, um, th which limited which limited the opportunities for other people to be at, at par, be on the same level. So this is a very important aspect of, of, the, of the thing. But the question that I posed, and uh, I will, inshallah, we will uh, keep adding to it, uh, is beyond, beyond the manifestation stage. Uh, by that I mean time is manifesting itself. It's unfolding itself day after day in a serial manner. But think of time as the created, one of the created elements, created identities. There was a time when there was no time. There was a time when there was no time. Which means the notion of time, the time, time is a, in, in God's, uh, uh, in, in God's, uh, creative act, there was a moment when he created time. Just as the physical objects we can say, well, he created the earth, he created the sun. In abstract sense, there are things which, all of these things, happiness, sadness, sorrow, huzn, um, all of these things are also by the amr, by the command. They are created entities. So time is a created entity. So uh, my question is not in the manifestation of time in the serial sense in which human societies evolve and structures evolve and uh, different, uh, different organizational processes take place, but the time itself. So at that level, yes, now both, three of you can say and then we'll take a break. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, I think she was the first one. Please say more, more, so we can uh, we can expand on that. Yeah. I, I agree with you that one problem uh, in modern man is the, the notion of time. But the problem is, uh, in this question also, I think the question is so problematic because uh, it has a assumption that we live in time. Time is serial, series number, series. Uh, yeah. movement of yeah, one uh, measure of movement quantitatively because that's why we call it better or worse yeah. mm -hmm. there are two kind of time in philosophical speaking time in quantitative dimension and qualitative dimension so yeah, quality dimension something that existential relationship with us subjective realm so uh, so the measure of uh, human actualization in this in this uh, meaning of the time. So uh, 
I think the crucial problem in modern men, he, they uh, lost this kind of meaning of time. Mm. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, yes, uh, what you were talking about, I, I've just, you know, uh, to say one thing uh, to which I believe uh, personally. That is, you know, the, 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 the importance or the significance or the conceptualization of time as profit vision. And obviously that may be a sort of an authority or sort of, you know, a reference point. And he says that And this, you know, these few wor you know, words of profit explains uh, the entire notion of the, of the time in which we are living. That you know we have, and it's not you know developmental. It has to be retrogressive rather than progressive. Mm. So this is what I have, and that is the proof as well as the measure as well as you know. Now it. we are going to stop uh, here for a break, but I would like to remind you uh, something that uh, wasn't specified at, uh, at the beginning, but it was in my mind. But it has become now extremely important for all of us to realize. Uh, I don't want to. Uh, have this session or these sessions in this format at all, that uh, uh, I say something and you agree or disagree. Uh, this is not the approach that I would like to take, especially now that uh, we have come to the most essential aspect of uh, these three days. But my effort is to actually come to a common spiritual understanding, and uh, uh, spiritual understanding I use very consciously, because uh, an understanding that transcends, that transcends our uh, various beliefs and uh, transcends, in a way, uh, rational thinking. So and the idea here is to leave these sessions with some kind of spiritual enlightenment, a spiritual understanding in addition to the intellectual understanding. In addition to, because if it's, I, I think I mentioned this early, early the, on the very first day that the effort is not to just have an academic discussion, but to have a taste, have a taste of that. Um, th this is this is experiential. So it is not that I have a position. Of course, I have a position because I have spent years and years thinking about these things. But it's not that I want to impose or I want to have that uh, just for you to accept it or reject it. That's not the case. We want to come to, uh, to a better understanding of the topic of the nature of spiritual crisis. We want to come to a better understanding of our own spiritual state at the end of these sessions. So please nourish yourself with, uh, with some food and try to minimize the the disposables. Uh, these, these are really meaningful acts of individual choice. These are, you cannot control the market economy, you cannot control the mass media, you cannot control the mafia that has produced these cups and disposables. Of course, we are individuals, we have no choice, we have no power. If I were the dictator of, a, of the world, I'll say, you know, <laughs> but I'm not, you are not. But I have the choice not to use this additional thing. You know, and it, it really makes a difference. It really makes a difference. We, 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 you know, we, our children, we, when they go, they take their cup from home to campus or wherever, they to drink or whatever. What happens is that after you have used a clay utensil for a six month period or one month period, you have actually developed a relationship with that piece of clay. It is not disposable anymore. I have a cup, clay mug that I've used for the last 30 years. Because I, I love that. I, love, I, I have a personal relationship. It's not disposable, thrown in there. It's an object in my life. Our, our grandfathers, our, our grandparents, they passed on things which they had used, which they have inherited, these huge containers made of metal, the, the, which their grandparents had used. And they went generation after generation. They were used because we minimized our in foot, our footprint on this, on this planet, on this earth. Other techniques to give us a different opening into understanding the nature of time and 
words you hear are processed, thoughts go into the mind, but uh, there are other senses that we all have. And uh, one of the things that uh, I'd like to do now is for us to receive a certain nourishment of the spirit itself. If somebody could uh, turn off the lights, the person who said he will do it has just gone out. Uh, I'd like the lights to be off.
So this uh, surah is actually all that we are trying to do here. In the sense of the transcendent, in the sense of the kingdom in the hereafter, the human condition is such that what we do here in this world is a preparation for the hereafter. And those who do not believe in the hereafter, uh, as far as the religious traditions are concerned, uh, they, they, have a, they have an attitude, a common attitude towards all of that um, rejection by saying simply that when you will find out, on the day you will find out, there will be no possibility of return. And hence, there is a certain degree of warning that exists in all religious traditions. In the parable of the marketplace and the vineyard that we did yesterday, the sense of uh, the transcendence is taken to be an essential aspect of the human intelligence, and this is related to the intellect, al The aim and the end of religion is salvation, but this is only in an exoteric sense, which means that the exoteric person who does not aspire, as in this surah we have three kinds of people, <clears throat> the muqarribun, those brought nearer, the people of the right and the people of the, re of the left. <coughs> the exoteric person is mainly concerned with the laws. He or she needs to be told, do this and don't do this, and the promise is of salvation, of paradise itself. Now, all religions have certain rights and certain practices and certain structures, and this is what was mentioned yesterday, that uh, the package that was offered is not, this is Rebecca saying that uh, she didn't find in the packages anything that she was looking for. The, these are, but however, these are the external structures which religions put on in order to enforce a certain way of life, a certain daily routine, which otherwise is in the human nature not to pay attention to. Uh, for example, fasting or, the pr or prayer, and these should not be trivialized because these are essential elements of the, uh, of the religious practice, which, uh, which come which they become easy and they become doable once the spiritual aspect is inside. Then the motor, the impetus is there. There is an in inner, inner energy that one gains by entering into that sacred tradition, whichever the tradition is, which makes it easy for the person to actually carry out uh, those religious rites. And uh, from the external, uh, once uh, when somebody is standing outside, they look like impositions and they look like a package, they look, look like something that is not uh, what want, but what wants. But the main goal is, of our religions is actually esoteric. It is inside, it's, the outer shell is, is, are these rituals, but the inside is the, uh, the point of uh, the kernel of the truth, of the essence. Now, in order to elucidate this point of time that uh, is the focus of our session now, the quality of time that we live is measured by our proximity to the divine. And I have taken this text from uh, one of the oldest Persian language uh, books of the Sabuf, uh, Ali Usman Hujveri's Kashf uh, al-Mahjub. Um, this is actually a parable. Uh, or it is the prelude to the parable, and the parable comes uh, within this passage that I, I want to quote. And uh, it was mentioned before that we should not be vague in these, uh, these things, but by the very nature of these things, they require a language that transcends the everyday language. So people uh, in the religious text talk in terms of parables and also the, so, the sub text. So the, um, this particular passage is about hal and waqt. Waqt is time. It's a term with which Sufis are familiar, and concerning which much has been said by the sheikhs. This is a quotation from uh, Ujveri. But my object, object is to establish the truth, not to give long explanations. Waqt is that whereby one becomes independent of the past, 
and the future. As for example, when an influence from God descends into his heart and produces such a concentration that one has no memory of the past and no thought of the future. A possessor of work says, our knowledge cannot apprehend the future and the past, and we are happy with God in the present. If we occupy ourselves with tomorrow, or let any thought of it enter our minds, we shall be veiled from God, and a veil is a great loss. Thus, Abu Sayyid Haraz, another Sufi, said, Do not occupy your precious time except with the most precious of things, and the most precious of human things is the state of being occupied with God between the past and the future. This is very beautiful, between the past and the future. And the Messenger of God said, I have a time with God in which none of the angels and prophets has entry. This is to say, in which the 18,000 words do not occur to my mind and have no worth in my eyes. Therefore, on the night of the ascension, when the kingdom of the heaven and the earth was arrayed before him in all its splendor, he did not look neither to the left nor to the right. This was mentioned by Dr. Jalal in this verse. Time is two times. This quotation actually comes from Halaj. Al uh, is nine. One in the state of gain, the other in the state of loss. The one in the state of gain is in the place of union, and the other in the place of separation. At both these times, the mystic is overpowered, because both his union and his separation are affected by God without any, any volition or acquisition on his part, as would make it possible to invest him with any attribute. When a man's power of volition is cut off from him, whatever he does or experiences is the result of time. Now comes the, the, the actual parable, and it's, uh, it's narrated by Al-Junaid, who of course is uh, one of the greatest Sufis uh, in the Islamic tradition. He said that I saw a dervish in the desert, sitting under a mimosa tree in a hard and uncomfortable spot, and asked him what made him sit there so still. He answered, I had a time, a waqt, and I lost it here. Now I am sitting and mourning. I inquired how long he had been sitting there. Twelve years, he said. Will not the Sheikh offer up a prayer on my behalf that perchance I may find my time again? al Junaid says that he left him, performed the Hajj, and prayed for him. He says my prayer was granted. On my return, I found him seated in the same place. Why, I asked him, do you not go from here since your wish has been granted? He replied, O Sheikh, I sat here at this place of desolation, where I lost all I had. Is it right that I should abandon it now, that I have found my lost treasure once more, and where I enjoy the company of God? Let the Sheikh go in peace, for I will mix my dust with the dust of this spot, that I may rise at the resurrection from this dust, which is the abode of my delight. This is the essence of what I have to offer. This waqt that we all possess. Not the time, not the serial time of our breaths falling out in serial time one after the other, but the essential quality of that connection with the Creator. That is the waqt, that is the real time that we all have. And for the, for the mystic, for him, who sat at that place for 12 years, when he lost his time there, the essence was that union, whatever the shape of that union is for each one of us, union in a very limited sense, that, that, atten that, uh, that attachment to the Creator. So let us go back to the, to the other parable and uh, try to explain it a li little bit more the workers in, in the vineyard. Now this parable of course comes from, uh, from the uh, New Testament, but as I said yesterday, there is a corresponding hadith of the Prophet as well, in terms of, uh, uh, of the quality of time. Although there are certain differences between the two, the parable in the, in the Bible as well as in the, in the hadith. 
Those familiar with the text would recall, and this is the text of Matthews, that the parable is led up to by a sharp distinction between exoterism and esotericism. There was a rich man, young man, who was attached to his wealth, who is, who is, to his wealth, to his worldly possessions. And thereby, he had closed himself spiritually. He was barren as far as the spiritual life was concerned, before uh, the parable is narrated in, in Matthew 20. 